one. You will hear a telephone conversation between two people about a flat. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hello, this is Simon Marshall. I spoke to you the other day about renting flat 3A. Oh yes. Hello Simon. What can I do for you? Well, there are a few health and safety things I'd like to run through if that's okay. Yes, fine. Right. Well, the first thing, bearing in mind it's quite an old house, is whether there's any damp. I'm thinking here of the exterior walls and the floor. Well, I've never known any problems with damp there. It was all right last time I checked, certainly, though that was before the recent wet weather. I'd better have another look and get back to you on that. OK. Now, the next thing is the gas supply. Do you have a safety certificate? A current one, that is. We do. All the gas appliances have been checked by a registered engineer. Yes, I was going to ask about that. When did they actually do the inspection? Let me think. They sent an engineer to check something early last year, but no, that wasn't the inspection. Oh, I remember now it was in the spring. In fact, I've got the certificate here somewhere. Yes, that's it. March 22nd, so it's just over five months ago. And the electricity. When was the last time all the wiring was inspected? I know it doesn't have to be checked as often as the gas, but it's still important, especially in older properties. As it happens, we had an electrician in when we redecorated flat 3A. If he looked at everything then, he would have charged us for it. I'll find the bill and check it if you like. Fine. And when was that? Uh, the decorators finished just before Easter, so that would be about 18 months ago. Uh -huh. Just one more point on the electrics. Are there enough plug sockets in the flat? It depends what you mean by enough, really. Well, I've got quite a lot of electrical things. Computer, radio, lamps, kitchen appliances and so on, and I'm wondering whether I could plug them all in without having cables trailing all over the place. I think there's one per room. That's fairly normal in older properties. <laughs> I'll take that as a no then. <laughs> all right. Now, another safety point. Is there a smoke alarm? Yes, there's one in the kitchen. And is it in good working order? I'll have to try it out and let you know. Right. Now, you mentioned the previous tenants. Do they, or anyone else who's lived in the flat, still have keys to the door? We're very strict about that. Everyone has to hand back the keys when they leave or we don't return the deposit. And those in 3A have always done so. You now have some time to look at questions. You mentioned a room where people can leave things, like suitcases and bags and things. Where exactly is that? Is it next to 3A, which I take it is on the third floor? Well, the apartment's on the third, yes. But the storeroom's a little way away, just past the second door to the right. Under the stairs, in fact. But it's on the same floor, isn't it? Yes, it is. Fine. Now, another thing I wanted to check is that there's hot water in the apartment. Oh, yes. It runs off the central heating. That was installed back in the 70s, I think, so there's a permanent supply. Mm, but is it really hot, not just warm or lukewarm? I suppose it depends what you mean by hot. But it's at a constant 60 degrees. 
Oh, that sounds fine. Yes, it used to be set at 55, but last year the tenants asked us to increase it, so we did. Oh, I'm glad about that. OK, now can you tell me a bit about the yard and the garden? How big are they? Well, the yard at the side of the house is about 20 square metres. Oh, so there's room for my motorbike then. Actually, it's only a 50cc moped, but I like to keep it off the road at night. Yes, there's more than enough space there, even with all the wheelie bins. And the garden? That's much bigger, about 150 square metres. Uh -huh. um, who looks after it, by the way? Old Mr Collins. He's almost 90, but he's out there every day. Uh -huh. And the last point, the TV. What size screen is it? It's 70 centimetres wide, I think. No, sorry, that was the old one. This one's 80. You can get 90-odd channels on it, so I'm told. Really? So there's a satellite dish on the roof, is there? No, it's cable TV here. It doesn't cost much between everyone, though. Ah, that's very interesting. OK, thanks for your help. I'll be in touch again soon. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a news broadcast on a radio station. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the news broadcast and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning and welcome to 2RC, your local radio news service for the Wesley area. And here are your headlines for this morning. More news from the police into the jewellery robbery that occurred last Tuesday in the centre of town. Comtech, the local computer hardware manufacturer, has announced that it must cut 40 jobs. New routes open up at the Wesley International Airport. Plans for the redevelopment of the Oakley Woods have been shelved. A local cricket team make it to the regional finals. And get set for a heat wave. First of all, police have released two descriptions for the two men wanted in connection with the robbery at the local jewellery store, Nichols, in the centre of town last Tuesday. At 9am, just when the store was opening, two men burst through the door and demanded bags to be filled up with jewellery. Although the two men were armed with baseball bats, the shopkeepers bravely attacked them and beat them off. Although the two men had motorcycle helmets on, these were knocked off during the scuffle, and the shopkeepers were able to get a good look at them. The first man is said to be about six foot in height, slight build, dark hair and a small moustache. He was wearing blue jeans, a white t-shirt and a black leather jacket. The second man is much shorter, around five foot eight, with a fat build and red hair and clean shaven. He was wearing a dark blue sweater and black jeans. They are both probably in their early twenties. The police hope to issue photo-fit pictures later today. The public are urged to call Wesley Police if they think they recognise either of the two men. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen to the rest of the news broadcast and answer questions 16 to 20. Comtech last night announced that they must release 40 workers. This was blamed on a downturn in sales and increased competition. The jobs to be lost will be a mixture of early retirement offerings and a spread from all departments in the company. Westley International Airport has been awarded by Cheap Air, the new low-cost carrier, four new routes into Europe. The new routes will be into four European countries, though the details have not yet been released. When the deals have been finalised, this will lead to a significant number of jobs. Environmentalists were delighted this morning by the news that plans by the local council to develop the Oakley Woods area have been shelved. The woods were to have been developed into a shopping area, but opposition from local residents and local environmental groups has led to a turnaround by the local council and they will now look for an alternative site. Westley Green, a local pressure group, says they are ecstatic that the council has bowed to the wishes of people in the area. Mr George Finchley, Mayor of Westley, made the announcement and said that the committee responsible took all available information into account before taking the decision and he hopes that Westley residents are happy that the local council are sensitive to their wishes when making decisions. East Moors CC, a local league cricket club, has made it to the finals of the Sunday League knockout cricket competition. They will play the final at home on Sunday 30th of August against Newbury CC. Go along and support if you are around that day, as you will be assured a great Sunday afternoon sport. And finally, get set for a heat wave for the remainder of the month of August. Weather experts have assured us that we will have three weeks of unbroken sunshine till the end of the month. Great news, but those of us who are experienced with the British weather will most likely greet this news with, let's wait and see. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two medical students, Caitlin and Hideki, discussing options for courses. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 21 to 23. Hi, Hideki. How are you? Fine. I'm glad I bumped into you. Have you got five minutes to sit down and discuss our extra course options for next term? Yes, yeah, sure. You mean the support courses for our modules? Yes. We've got three choices, and I'm not sure which would be best for us to do. Let's have a look. Um, yeah, we could do science and ethics. Sounds quite interesting. Yes, but I think we should be thinking what we get out of each course. Mm. So, science and ethics, there's a lot of reading and research to do. And I don't think it comes up in the exams, does it? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, I see we have to do assignments and we get our score from that. But what it would do is to force us to get better at doing essays and reports, you know, organizing them and using the right kind of language. Mm. Might be worthwhile. Yeah, you're right. An alternative is the pharmacology prelim course. Oh, 
I think it's in case we want to go on to transfer to pharmacology at the end of the year, because lots of students do. Mm -hmm. So it depends what we want to do in the future. But apparently, they send you off to find out about various companies and the differences between their products. It would give you lots of practice in investigative studies and analysis. I think I'd quite enjoy that. Yes, I see your point. Um, then the other option is reporting test results. Sounds a bit boring. Not sure why they have a separate course just for that. Well, I could certainly do with some help in that. Because if you go out into industry, that's what you'll spend most of your time doing. Mm. So it's got a very practical application. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to go for pharmacology. Me too. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 24 to 30. So, let's have a look at it in more detail. Oh, goodness. If we do pharmacology, then we have to do a supplementary maths course. Oh, no, that's not fair. Mm. Mind you, I think I need it. <laughs> Does that mean we have twice as many lectures? No. This maths is only a short course. The chemistry department are responsible, and they do it in the third term. So, we've got all next term to settle into the pharmacology bit. Oh, I find the tutor makes a real difference. Some of them make chemistry so easy, and some of them I can't understand at all. Like that one we had from Oxford University. Oh. <laughs> Mind you, the one on this course should make sense, because he's a lecturer who's coming in for a few weeks from industry. So, at least it'll be linked to the real world. <laughs> yeah. The project we have to do on this pharmacology course is huge, and it doesn't give us much time. We have to make a decision about what we want to do on the project as soon as we start in January, and then hand in our plans before the end of the month. Doesn't give us much time to sort out what's possible or not. Mm. I mean, doesn't the scale of our project depend on what resources we can have, like what equipment we can use? I suppose so, though I think there's plenty available. For example, it says that if we need to do any experiments, then we can use all the equipment in the new lab, as long as we book it. Oh, OK. It's slowly beginning to take shape for me. I think it'll be a good course. I'm just worried that I get enough support to do it. Huh. I think you'll be OK. And the tutors are always available if you get stuck. Oh, actually, it says that if you're not sure, then in December, they'll be running one or two additional seminars. So I might go to those. Actually, what's quite interesting is that at the end of the course, when our project is completed, then we have to do a presentation on it. Oh. I think that's quite good practice. Oh, a bit scary, though. <laughs> well... It shouldn't be too bad, as they say that we can do it in pairs. Oh. Spread the load, as it were. <laughs> oh, good. I have done presentations before, but I'm always very nervous. And is the presentation what we're assessed on, then? Let me look. Um, ah, it says that we have an interview and we get a mark for the whole course, depending on how well we do in that. Oh, right. OK. So I that is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four.
you will hear a monologue on the subject of an amazing discovery. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome everybody. My name is Derek Fisher and I'll be taking you through this talk on a truly amazing discovery made by my team of researchers last year. As I'm sure you know, we discovered Tiktaalik rose, a so-called missing link in the evolutionary process, a fish that walked on land we made this extraordinary discovery in the Canadian Arctic. I should emphasize right at the beginning that I do not have any evidence to suggest that this was the only such fish to make the leap from the sea to the land. I think that further discoveries may await researchers. Anyway, the fossil discovery illuminates a chapter in the history of life on Earth that was essential to the ultimate emergence of human beings. This is an impression of Tiktaalik rose, which, we believe, lived about 375 million years ago. As you can see, it has features that blur the distinction between fish and terrestrial limbed creatures. The fossils that we found on Ellesmere Island, 600 miles from the North Pole, are a fine example of evolution in action. They have allowed us to freeze frame a process of adaption to land that took tens of millions of years, and which made possible the development of all the mammals, birds, reptiles and amphibians that have existed since. Without creatures such as Tiktaalik, there would have been no dinosaurs, no primitive mammals and none of the hominids such as Australopithecus africanus and Homo erectus that started the human family tree. This animal represents the transition from water to land, the part of history that includes ourselves. It's as much a part of our history as, say, Australopithecus africanus. Now you can see those teeth. From that, it is clear to us that Tiktaalik rose was a predator with sharp teeth and a head shaped like a crocodile's that grew to between 4 feet and 9 feet. That's between 1.2 metres and 2.7 metres long, for those of you using the metric system. We named it after consultation with elders from the Inuit people, who are native to the region, who suggested their word for large shallow water fish. The second part of the name honours the person who funded our research, but wishes remain anonymous. It had several remarkable anatomical features that show it was capable not only of wading in shallow water, like slightly earlier fish on the cusp of the move to land, but also of supporting itself outside the water in the manner of four-limbed animals or tetrapods. This is where Tiktaalik truly blurs the boundary between fish and land animals. This animal is both fish and tetrapod. At first, we jokingly called it a fisherpod. Unlike fish, it had a clearly defined neck and a strong ribcage that would have enabled it to stand outside water. Its pectoral fins had a wrist joint which enabled it to crawl on the ground. This wrist is sufficiently similar to that of later animals, including human beings, to suggest that Tiktaalik or something very like it was an ancestor of all subsequent land animals. However, we cannot be sure of that. When we talk about the fish's wrist, we're talking about the origin of parts of our own wrist. It is absolutely clear from Tiktaalik's skeleton that it could support itself in shallow water or on land. This is why it represents a critical early phase in the evolution of all limbed animals, including humans. We found the Tiktaalik fossils in 2004 after a five-year search of a rock formation on Ellesmere Island 
one of the large islands that comprise the north of Canada. This site was chosen because it was, or more exactly, the rocks were laid down during the late Devonian period, between 380 million and 365 million years ago. When the transition of fish from sea creatures to creatures that could survive on land is known to have taken place, it may surprise you to know that although the rocks are now within the Arctic Circle, in the late Devonian they lay close to the equator. We, as individual humans, don't notice plate movements because dramatic changes can only be seen over millions of years. But the continents as we know them today. Have moved considerably and will continue to do so. This exciting discovery is providing a much deeper understanding of this evolutionary milestone. Previous fossils representing this evolutionary event have really been fish with a few land characteristics, or land vertebrates with a few residual fish characteristics. These fossils show an animal that sits bang in the middle. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Oh, 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 oh,